These days, you've got your choice if you want blood-filled hardcore horror on television. But 60 years ago, we didn't have The Haunting of Hill House, American Horror Story, or The Walking Dead. No, the first real Nightmare Factory was Rod Serling's seminal series, The Twilight Zone. Now, granted, I was too young to watch the original airing of that show, but I grew up on the reruns, and it always delivered the creep factor. And without The Twilight Zone's influence, we wouldn't have Black Mirror, we wouldn't have Jordan Peele's amazing films, and we wouldn't have M. Night Shyamalan's good movies. And since Peele's revamp of the series is right around the corner, this is the perfect time to look back at that original series. So let's take a look at the top 10 Twilight Zone episodes that I promise will creep you out on this, The Real School Countdown. Number 10, Living Doll. One thing you'll learn about the show is that the monsters, creatures, or aliens are rarely the creepiest part. Having said that, there is nothing creepier than a vengeful, homicidal doll. Now, television historians have actually gone on record as saying that this is when the trope was reinvented. Because before this, whenever it was a creepy, murderous doll, it was always a ventriloquist dummy. Which we all know is the creepiest of all species of doll. But like I said before, not the creepiest part. This episode, like so many others in the Twilight Zone, is of course subtextual. So this is a dark, subtle look at domestic abuse, as Telly Savaris plays a cold, distant, and abusive stepfather. What's also great about this episode is you ask so many questions, you talk about it after you've watched it. Was domestic abuse so prevalent post-war? Was the doll actually homicidal, or was this a broken man's delusion? And did he deserve his just desserts? Number 9, Long Distance Call. Similar questions to this episode, but also similar creep factor. Instead of a doll whispering in the ear of a madman, we have a dead grandmother whispering in the ear of her grandson, here played by sci-fi prodigy Bill Mummy, who actually appeared in the Twilight Zone three different times. The Zone would often take innocent things and twist them into dark, sinister things, like a doll, a childhood toy, or a child himself. And whether or not you have kids, you have to admit that sometimes Kids be creepy. Sure, for the most part, your kid is absolutely sweet, but sometimes your toddler will say something so dark you think he's Rosemary's baby. But once again, it's just a great bit of subtextual writing about how different people deal with the loss of a loved one. Do we let go the memories of those who we have lost, or do we hang on to those no matter what the cost? Either way, you will hold on to the memory of this episode. Number eight. Time enough at last. This is an absolute classic. Whenever they show a montage of the zone, this is always included. So why should my countdown be any different? So it's important to ask, why was this one specifically so prolific? There were a ton of iconic episodes in the very first season, but I will tell you why. It is one of the greatest twists of all time. And as an English teacher, I have used it countless times to teach students about irony. But why is it creepy? Like many other episodes, this ironic twist is also kind of sad and creepy at the same time, and that has a lot to do with the empathy latent performance of the late great Burgess Meredith. It also has to do with the fact that Serling often wrote about the nuclear holocaust, and once again, it features fairly predominantly. Remember that Serling wrote that iconic ending to the original Planet of the Apes, and the scary thing is, we are closer to nuclear war than perhaps we've ever been. So really, let's just work on talking apes, because that'll help things out. Number seven, the monsters are due on Maple Street. Yet another classic and another moral that stays topical today. Yet another brilliant teleplay specifically written by Serling, where in post-war America, how we were losing our empathy, how we were losing our humanity because of the Cold War and because of the fear that loomed over us that created xenophobia and mistrust of others. Seriously, did he have a time machine? Could he see the 21st century? I personally think it's very creepy because it taps into something primal, and unfortunately we've seen it in the waves of generations that have come since the 60s. It wasn't just the Cold War, it wasn't just post 9-11, it's happening today in a lot of Western cultures where once again, hate is taking over and we're losing our humanity. Number six, Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. I know what you're thinking. Nobody could really be creeped out by a gremlin that looks like this. Maybe Shatner's acting, that's creepy. No, it's not my intention to introduce this episode to mock a Canadian treasure, nor is it just a precursor to Shatner impressions for generations to come. No, it still remains prevalent to today, and I'll explain why. If you haven't really seen this pattern yet, it's really that Serling knew what made humans tick, and that's what's horrifying. 
And even though Serling didn't write this specific episode, a young director named Richard Donner actually knew what Serling was trying to get across. That the fear is really not being believed when people don't trust you. That can be very lonely and I think there is a creepiness in that loneliness that we see in that terrible performance with god-awful dated FX makeup. Or maybe you just don't like flying. That works too. Number five, the masks. This one is just plain creepy. Yes, this episode has irony. It has an amazing dose of karma and it was once again written by Serling himself. However, the ending doesn't stick into your mind because of subtext. It's just chilling. It also has the honor of being directed by Ida Lupino, who's the only female director in Twilight Zone history. That's the great thing about the original Twilight Zone. Sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's subtextual, sometimes you really have to think about it, and sometimes it's four disfigured faces staring directly at you, teaching you about human behavior. Which, let me tell you, as a kid watching these reruns, it's pretty effective. Number four, The Silence. This is another episode where the ending is just engraved in my memory. The most memorable part about it, there's no real sci-fi or fantasy to it, and that's what makes it even creepier. Since we've talked about his writing a lot, let's talk about how well read Rod Serling was, because this episode has a little bit of Chekhov mixed with a dark twist on the Gift of the Magi. Two men make a bet, the older gentleman bets that the younger one cannot stay silent for an entire year, and in the end, no one wins. It once again shines a light on a dark corner of humanity as both men's pride get in the way. Number three, will the real Martian please stand up? This one, on the other hand, is just pure sci-fi fun. This is a quintessential whodunit as bus passengers are snowed in and have to stop at a tiny little diner. And as they're bottled in, they realize one of them wasn't on the bus and yet the diner was empty when they all walked in. Okay, maybe it sounds a little boring? Throw in a UFO. And that's just the first tiny twist. When everyone realizes that one person couldn't have possibly walked or driven in the snowstorm and yet they weren't on the bus and yet they weren't in the diner when everybody walked in, there's only one reasonable explanation. One of them is a Martian. You could tell that Serling was just having fun with this episode and yet it has so much in common with other episodes, at least in terms of subtext. Not trusting one another, fear playing tricks on your mind in the Cold War era, but that's not why this episode is memorable. It's totally a macabre, funny, B-movie ending, but it is just perfect. Number two, Eye of the Beholder. The words moral, ironic, iconic, brilliant, yeah, they've all been tossed around a lot during this list, but this specific episode, I believe, is the best crafted in the entire series. Even without the brilliant writing of Serling, okay, I said that again, even without the iconic twist, all right, that one more time as well, even without the direction of Douglas Hayes, this is just 20 minutes of purely brilliantly crafted television. It creates intrigue, it creates tension, and it is so well pieced together. It's just one of those fantastic episodes. How do you make an entire episode where 95% of the time you don't see faces? It's just unheard of. Because of this, you're already on edge. You want to know, no, you need to know what exactly is happening and then you get one of the greatest twists of all time. It is so satisfying to watch for the first time. But in my opinion, not the greatest. Number one, to serve man. This episode is the culmination of all the successful elements they brought to the previous nine. This episode is political, subtextual, clever, creepy, goofy, fun. It's just the episode that I think of when people mention The Twilight Zone, and it's absolutely my favorite of the series. It's just another episode that keeps you guessing to the very end. Should you trust the goofy-looking aliens? Well, of course you should. They're here to help us. Or maybe they're not. Or maybe they are. I don't know, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, it might be teaching you a lesson about fear and mistrust in Cold War era America, blah, 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 subtext. It's just fun. There are a couple things that stick out for me. One, Serling obviously loves irony, but he also loves homonyms. And two, this is a really bleak ending, and if that doesn't give you the creeps, at least on some level, I don't know what's wrong with you. Agree or disagree with the list? Leave your picks for top 10 in the comments section below. And until next time, school's out. Hey Real Students, thanks for watching. If you want to subscribe to Real School, click that round Real School logo right beside me. Also click that damn notification bell so you're aware of all of Real School's new content. You can follow me on Twitter and of course, if you get anything out of Real School, you can always give a little back. Just click the link in the description below or the button down there and you can become part of my Patreon team.